Welcome, Jim and Austin. Austin, you mentioned some things that are going to be happening up in the Arctic soon. What What's going on? Uh, look, Dan, there have been a number of things going on in the Arctic, military-wise and confrontation-wise. Uh, since uh, this is a bad pun coming since the Cold War began, but you know, uh, 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 there was a, we made a big deal talking about the U.S. and we should have of our nuclear submarines, the uh, Nautilus, our first one, and then Skipjack uh, surfacing in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, went through some tests too to make sure that they their mass were strong enough to break through surface ice, and they were careful about where they uh, where they did it too but it, there's presence in the arctic and demonstrating that the u.s uh, navy had the uh, capability of putting a sophisticated nuclear submarine uh in the Ar- arctic ocean and it's a <coughs> the navy pulling a presence patrol in a place that it's awfully hard to have a presence uh like that you have air but you know air is temporary flying over plus remember the polar shot with the long-range missile with the icbm was the way the u.s and uh, the ussr were supposed to fight the uh, nuclear missile war because you're it's the shortest way to get uh, an icbm from uh, kansas to uh, moscow and vice and vice versa so you had Remember NORAD? Well, NORAD still exists, but the dew line, that was the distant early warning system that uh, was huge radar installations uh, running from uh, Alaska uh, really to, to uh, uh, right across uh, Canada and, and east. And we had uh, surface ships that also in, engaged in it. We had a experimental base in northern uh, Greenland, by the way, during the Cold War, called Thule, which uh, remnant of it still exists, but a, lo- a lot of it, was, it just existed in I- uh, ice caves. Now, I'm talking about trying to lay up the background of saying that operations in the far, far north uh, aren't new, uh, and uh, they've been part. They were they were part of the of the Cold War game. Uh, confrontation because it wasn't a game uh, between the, the United States and communist communist Russia now in the last again this isn't new but in the last 30 years it's more relevant <clears throat> numerous resources have been identified uh, the Canadians have done a big job of this. I mean, Prudhoe Bay and the uh, oil find in the, on the north slope of Alaska is not uh, not new. Uh, it's 50-year-old news, but uh, there's more indications. In fact, there's, uh, there's proof of uh, significant mineral deposits. Uh, Greenland has uh, a... Not quite a corner, but it's got a significant <laughs> a number of rare earths that are vital to uh, high tech, uh, high technology, the electronics, and also some uh, new alloys that uh, permit metal to just creating smart metals as as uh, is one way uh, one way to des- describe it. Uh, so it, there's reasons to be in these up in these har- uh, these har- harsh conditions you, know, you do run into another battle too with uh, certain kinds of environmentalists but you have to begin to wonder at least I do <clears throat> about the ferocity of some of these environmentalists when they don't uh, confront China and Russia uh, for the, the same kind of uh, for, for actually uh, far more uh, primitive and destructive uh, in in extraction methods. Now, in the last 10 years, there's been a revival of uh, competition, and there's been claims the Russians have made much more um, aggressive claims, really really encroaching on uh, Canadian territory. Um, They've also 
tried the same thing in uh, in the Arctic areas where they uh, bump up against uh, uh, Norwegian islands that are uh, at the uh, at the Arctic Circle, and uh, and uh, heaven heavens knows that uh, they they do the same thing when they. Uh, uh, well, I've, I already mentioned the uh, running into uh, the, the Canadians. <clears throat> the Norway, if you look the way Norway bends across, Norway and Russia run into each other uh, right at the very at Nor- – I think it's Nord Cap or, or the Northern Cape, uh, Cape area. And therefore, that the way that exclusive economic zones are, are constructed under the U.N., Convention of law, a law of the sea that they've they've got the, the extensive uh, maritime maritime development rights. Now the upside is is there are a lot of places that the resource disagreements has been worked out diplomatically. Well, at least that was the case until uh, Putin decided that he was going to be more aggressive about it and you know it's uh, he's gotten more aggressive since 2014 when the uh, when uh, Russia invaded and annexed uh, Crimea and got away with a territorial grab now the other territorial grab with maritime uh, demands of course South China Sea is classic well, that's uh, that's China with its fake islands and uh, China has declared itself to be by the way Dan an Arctic nation that's uh, interesting. They ha- don't have any uh, territory uh, anywhere near the Arctic Circle. That could be a threat to Russia because the uh, Chinese say the Russians stole uh, Siberia from them. I'm sure that that's the way it's read in Moscow. But you know, for right now, that's <clears throat> that claim is. Uh, on hold because they've got to confront the United States and the, and the free world. That's, I don't say they have to, but that's that's what uh, what they're up to. But China makes that claim aggressively. They're an Arctic nation. Therefore, they have interest and rights, not just interests, but rights in the uh, Arctic region. And what they have tried to do, you know, let's take Greenland as, as an example, is use their uh, economic weapons where they come in and, and provide money, buy mines, buy mineral rights, buy off politicians, uh, yeah, buy off politicians, and uh, try to manipulate it through the uh, you know, using a diplomatic and, and economic uh, elements of power, you know, you know, dime, diplomacy, I, information, intelligence, military, and economics. So that's, that's what they've uh, tried to do. In, you ask about Military exercises. I'm going to get back to that uh, very quickly here. But realize, too, that in the last, really since 2012, Russia has been much more aggressive with air intrusions. They've done it in the Baltic. There's a uh, a column of mine that we've still got up in the, the On Point uh, archives about the bluff attack on uh, Bornholm uh, Island in uh, the the Baltic, a Danish uh, island that's uh, that the Russians don't like. They've never liked the fact that the Danes have it, but they, uh, Russia has gotten much more uh, aggressive in uh, penetrating U.S. airspace in Alaska, and uh, you've caught some of that with some of the photos that you uh, pull off of the. Uh, uh, Pentagon uh, PAO uh, p- page because pictures of F-22 Raptors and uh, in uh, based in Alaska uh, f- flying out to intercept these uh, long-range Russian bombers that are playing really Cold War games again. They've also done it in the Atlantic. They're being more uh, uh, aggressive uh, in the Barents Sea and approaching. Oh, the big gap, you know, Britain, Iceland, Greenland. So that that is an aspect of uh, of this competition. What you were referring to specifically are these northern uh, exercises, and 
I, I, I should have done a, a little research to refresh my mind on it, but I think they're called Trident Junction is the, the name that comes to mind. If I got it wrong, I know we'll get e- e- emails. It doesn't matter really about the name. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, it's who's involved. They're NATO exercises, and the big player is, uh, is our U.S., uh, Great Britain, uh, and uh, we've, the Germans have, have been in it. Uh, can you believe the Germans show up? Uh, well, they do show up with this. Uh, Poles have played in it. And the Norwegians, of course, are always big players. Um, but Sweden and Finland have begun to participate. The Finns, even in, I don't want to say it was in the 2019 exercise, uh, had NATO forces in Finland, the Finns, uh, their part of the exercise was to defend a couple of their islands and also respond to an invasion. And, of course, the direction the invasion was coming from, it was coming from east, from the east, and that had, they were running an exercise to combat the Russians. It sounded like winter war, doesn't it? The, uh, when Stalin went after the fence, except you had uh, U.S. forces and <clears throat> Norwegians and a few other NATO contingents. The Swedes even played in it, and uh, I don't have a, a high resolution on what they did. They had one base that was uh, used by uh, NATO forces, and that's not news. It's been used as a landing spot of a plane uh, finisher. Danish or Norwegian uh, aircraft were were in uh, were in trouble, but it got a little bit more uh, visibility in the in this uh, in this exercise. And one reason it got more visibility is that there are at least two conservative, moderate conservative. Uh, uh, factions, I should say, in, in, in Sweden that are publicly for joining NATO because they said, you know, the, the Cold War is over and we still know who the enemy is. And this comes after, of course, the uh, Crimean annexation and the attack on on Ukraine. There are Finns that – and Finland is still and, – and Sweden are still nominally neutral, but the Finns talk about it as well. And it's obviously not talked because they're conducting military exercises outright uh, with uh, NATO NATO forces. Uh, the Canadians have played in this too. I should uh, I, I should mention. So uh, that is, I, I'm be interested to hear Jim's reaction to that. But that's really the most significant component. That Russian, it's not just saber rattling. That they've used they've used the saber in Europe, and the Finns know that that is a very very bad sign. So do the Poles, and you know, there's no doubt the Russians have made the Russians have made it clear that the the their uh, at least their they they are prepared to threaten the Baltic. Well, they're getting a counter reaction, and the big NATO exercises that have Finnish players in it, Swedish players, at whatever level, that sends a huge diplomatic uh, message. And I think it's a good one. I'm going to add one other thing, too. I, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell a quick war story, but it's relevant to, to this. Uh, when I was on active duty in Iraq in the uh, plan section I was in, there was a Danish officer, and we got to talking about the – Cold War from Denmark's perspective, uh, the Danes really take uh, had, do a lot of air control work or, or <laughs> an intelligence gathering on NATO's northern flank, which is, should be no no surprise. And again, the Bornholm Island is a, is one reason. But he said that there was so much constant interplay with the Swedes and Finns. And Norwegians, sometimes it would be the Norwegians taking the lead on it because they all knew who the, who the enemy was. And Danish uh, military air controllers, airspace and having access to uh, NATO, uh, NATO sensors and the like, at times there'd be trade-offs with the Swedes. 
It doesn't surprise me at all. In, in other words, what do you guys see? This is what we can do for you. Yes, and I'm I'm talking with this at the you know the conversation uh, conversation level, and that's all it went into. No no specifics on it, but it didn't surprise me at all. What's happened now, and really the uh, invasion of taking Crimea and the invasion of, of Ukraine is, is that they've moved the two nominal Nordic neutrals into uh, to the point of saying, "Sorry, we know who our friends are." Uh, anyway, I think that's uh, that. I think that laid out the, the the history on this resource wars. I guess I ought to mention the fact that China tried to pull off the a rare earths a coup in, in Greenland, but uh, the, the the Greenlanders who have Danish passports uh, seem to have stuffed that on their own. They know a they they know a con job when they see one. So, Jim, take it away, Jimmy. <laughs> Uh, ever since Putin took over in 2000, uh, he has, uh, as Austin, uh, you know, went into, has sought to um, regain control, if not ownership, of what they call the near abroad. And those are basically the parts of the old Soviet Union uh, that are, how should I put it, mainly in Europe. And are most uh, most vulnerable uh, to being, you know, retaken. <laughs> they made a mistake. They, they first tried it out in Georgia in 2008, when they grabbed two small parts of uh, of terrain which were basically full of non-Georgians, and they kept it. And they basically since integrated it into Russia. The uh, uh, in Ukraine, of course, they they bit off more than they could chew. And in Belarus, they have big problems because they have a uh, Soviet-style, you know, president for life there. But he's running into local problems, and the Russians aren't sure they want to take over and inherit it. But uh, as far as the Arctic goes, one of the other initiatives of Putin was to revive the uh, Soviet-era uh, military control of the 5,600 kilometer, 5,600, uh, 56, yeah, 5,600. A kilometer Arctic coast they have, you know, going from the Koala or basically the Norway uh, to uh, uh, you know to the border with Alaska. Um, this is suddenly more valuable, uh, even even with the decline in oil and natural gas prices, you know, after 2013 because of the fracking, etc. Um, they uh, they decided that they're not only going to rebuild the uh, Soviet you know era. Uh, military bases, air bases, uh, mainly, as well as their uh, ice icebreaker fleet, which was uh, falling apart. They had they only now are starting to replace the uh, nuclear powered um, first generation nuclear powered icebreakers uh, with four new ones. They're running into problems with that because again, in Russia they found out that in doing large warships, anything larger than a frigate, say, uh, they have serious problems uh, with. Basically, um, management and, and and technical skills of the workers available to them. All the really competent people who built a lot of their Cold War ships uh, immediately departed you know, after the Soviet Union fell. Because one thing that the Soviet Union uh, reimposed when they took over from the Tsars, they basically revived uh, feudalism, uh, the, uh, the serfs. And, uh, you know, people put people look at me strange and I said, well, think about it. The main thing about serfs was you weren't a slave, but you were basically owned by the local uh, boyar or lord. Uh, you couldn't move. It was against the law uh, to move uh, from uh, the uh, place where you were born unless you, you know, unless you had permission from your your overlord. Um, uh, they even, could even control what occupation you took and uh, in some places even who you could marry. Um, and this was a uh, this is this is considered by many the, the majority of the Russians who were subject to it is to be the equivalent of slavery in many exa- cases in many uh, in many instances it was but uh, <laughs> the Soviets without missing a beat reimposed all that and that meant that you know talented people had to take what they were given and a lot of them were given shipyard jobs which they didn't particularly want. Uh, and had to take what they were being they were offered for pay, et cetera, et cetera. Well, well, that disappeared in 1991, and poof, 
like that, a lot of the talent left the defense industries. Uh, they, they they managed to keep a lot of the the higher end, you know, the scientists and and the you know, development engineers, because they were always treated, you know, very well. But again, not well enough. A lot of them, you know, immigrated, if not just looked for other jobs inside the uh, the Soviet Union. Now, what Putin needed more than anything else, you know, it's like Stalin in the 1930s. He needed money. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't just starve the, uh, the, 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 the peasants by stealing all their, their food and what have you and selling it, exporting it to the West. Um, they had natural resources up on the North Coast. Now, they've had trouble developing those. In fact, one of the reasons why they lost the, the, the Cold War was uh, the United States wised up to the fact that they were dependent upon the United States for a lot of these specialized oil exploration and drilling technology um, that the Russians needed on the North Coast stuff that like we developed uh, in, in northern Alaska and in other, you know, you know, offshore in general, but especially in cold weather. Uh, so after nine, in, during the 1990s, the Russians went out, you know, the government and bought as much as they could or afford and developed new fields. And they found a lot more because they had better uh, exploration methods, technology from the West. Um, they were able to discover a lot more than they realized was there. So they realized they had a bonanza. That was one reason for the remilitarization. <laughs> but there was also the uh, the warming of the Arctic, which actually happens periodically over the over the millennium. But that's another story. You don't want to get into these days. It's not PC. Be that as it may, you take advantage of the warming and try and establish a um, <clears throat> a navigable. Uh, uh, passage for large ships at, at least you know for four or five months a year uh, now in order to make that work what they needed was more bases up there and more uh, more basically uh, uh, ocean going you know uh, uh, survey ships because they they found out well they already knew there were a lot of reefs and shoals and basically hazards of the sea uh, for ships uh, using the warmer the ice free coastal route you know, during, you know, uh, nearly half of the year. Uh, it varies. Some years you only get a month or two. That's one reason why they're building more icebreakers because the reason Canadians always had a lot of, relatively speaking, icebreakers and the United States had them uh, was because uh, the northern parts of the United States freeze up more than they used to. But when I was a kid, I remember the, the Hudson would ice over to the, uh, and, and I lived on the widest part of the Hudson, about five kilometers to Havistraw Bay, um, but further north from us, but even down as far as Havistraw Bay, you would get ice in the in the shipping channel, uh, and uh, the Coast Guard had icebreakers, which have all, I think now, almost all of them had been retired, and we'd see the icebreaker going up and down, you know, keeping the shipping channel free. Well, it's even worse for the Russians, because they have a lot of northern ports, uh, where that is a is a regular problem, but what they did do, which alarmed the Finns and, and at, well the Finns and especially the Norwegians, uh, in 2011, uh, Putin ordered the formation of a Arctic Brigade. This is a specialized 8,000 man, um, uh, how should I put it, Polar Infantry Brigade. Now, uh, in the other Arctic countries, uh, you know, Finland, uh, lesser extent Norway. Canada and Alaska, we depend upon a lot on on making it attractive for uh, Arctic natives. You know, Inuit in Canada and and the United States, the Sami in uh, in uh, in Finland, and uh, a number of other tribes, which I forget the names of. Some of them are the ancestors of the American Indians, uh, genetically, um, uh, are up there. And uh, they basically made it made them a deal, you know, uh, they they couldn't refuse. A, you're going to defend your 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 homeland in case of an invasion, and B, we're going to you know equip you and uh, give you neat new weapons and whatnot. Uh, the Russians really didn't have much of that because along much of their uh, polar coast, there was very little population up there. Uh, in fact, there's there's always been very little population out in the far east. Um, China still claims the Arctic coast, what they call the Russian Far East, a lot of our stock in, you know, up north. Uh, the Chinese have never given up that claim. They markedly did not give it up 
uh, in uh, in 1949 uh, when the Russians were celebrating uh, their you know their taking over of China, um, and uh, and to this day they don't. So that's what the Russians are very nervous about because that's the eastern you know terminus of their their Arctic border, and, and to have it uh, in the hands of the Chinese uh, is not a pleasant thought. But Russians have other problems versus the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese now have a larger and better equipped army, uh, and they're they're catching up in in, uh, in air force capability. But where the Russians did gain ground, so to speak, uh, was with the, with their Arctic. They reopened and uh, and refurbished the uh, Cold War air bases and small you know uh, harbors, Arctic harbors, and what have you. Uh, they are rebuilding, uh, you know, their, their icebreaker fleet, uh, especially the conventional ones. Uh, they're building a new class of uh, Coast Guard war, Coast Guard cutters, as we would call them, that have, have limited icebreaking capability. And these can take over a lot of the duties that the, the, the uh, full-on icebreakers create. Uh, like the Arcticas, the, their heaviest ones, they could basically crack uh three meter or like ten foot thick ice. Uh most other icebreakers can do a, a meter or two uh or like these these uh icebreaker warships uh can do less than a meter but that's enough in most cases. They don't get the really thick ice you get along the uh nor- way north of the Arctic Circle. Um the uh uh the Norwegians are very nervous about this because they've always, as Austin pointed out, they got these islands, which they, in some cases, they share, uh, you know, ownership of with the Russians. Uh, but because there is now offshore, you know, in the water, uh, under the autumn water deposits of natural gas and oil, uh, it's more important for the Russians to extend their claims. Now, the Chinese claims. Uh, that is even more circular than the ones they have in the South China Sea. But I suspect the Russians believe that ultimately those claims rest upon reclaiming uh, the lost lands that are now the uh, the Far Eastern uh, Russian uh, 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 department, as it were, province. I mean, Siberia is a much larger area, but it, it, it shares with the uh, the Russian Far East the same lack of population, lack of people wanting to live there. And of course, uh, the Russians fear they're going to lose their their Far East because more ethnic Russians, you know, Slavs, are leaving uh, for better jobs elsewhere, and more Chinese are moving in. Uh, some of them are doing this, you know, semi legally. They come in as traders. Uh, the Russians are hiring a lot of North Koreans, real cheap, uh, to work, uh, basically to provide labor that they can't get locals to do anymore, mostly lumbering and mining and what have you. Um, so the Russians are trying to make the best of a bad situation. They have indeed, you know, claimed their their military sovereignty over the their northern coast, and that's a pretty big job because, like I said, it's over five thousand kilometers. Um, but as Austin points out, you know they're, they're they're also beefing up the traditional threat they have posed to Finland and uh, and Norway. Norway shares a very small you know border land border with uh, with Russia, uh, but it's so sparsely populated uh, that the Norwegians realize that they have to have. Well, I'm, that's one reason why they want F 35s <laughs> They're buying those. Um, and they're they're basically encouraging NATO uh, to come play in our our new playground in the frozen north, uh, which is popular once in a while. But the, the you know American and even Canadian troops are not really keen on spending too much time in the frozen north. You know, even Canadians go to Florida in the in the winter time. But anyway, the um, uh, uh, the claims are are very real, and right now Russia is ahead because basically they always they always were ahead because they had the largest Arctic land border. Uh, actually, technically Canada is larger, but theirs is very you know convoluted and running back and forth and what have you, all the way down to you know to uh, Hudson's Bay and what have you. Um, but as far as straight line, relatively straight line. Uh, Arctic border. It's the Russians who have the most to lose, and they've uh, they fortified it. They've also, lastly, they fi- finally completed their their uh, revamp of their Cold War uh, coastal artillery, well missiles. Uh, late in the Cold War, uh, well even middle of the Cold War, they started replacing the old guns they still had with missiles. 
uh, anti-ship missiles, basically the same ones they put on on warships, uh, but fired from uh, mobile or you know stationary uh, bases. They've since replaced all those. The last ones to replace were the ones uh, covering Kamchatka, you know, covering the the uh, Perissa Strait. That's the one where they have the uh, complications with Japan over the Kuril Islands. The Russians took and don't want to give back. Um, and um, and further north. Uh, so the Russians have their, you know, their borders well guarded. Uh, the question is, as, as uh, they have to get out from under the sanctions because they really can't exploit it. For example, the, uh, there were complaints from the Russian military about once the, uh, once the sanctions came in, they couldn't get a lot of the specialized Arctic warfare equipment they were expecting to buy from the West. And so they were told to improvise and, you know, well, you make the best you, best you can of the situation. But uh, as we point out in our Russian coverage, uh, Putin's running out of excuses, you know, for uh, for defeating the sanctions uh, because he's not. The living standards are visibly declining year by year. Uh, I think in, in terms of, uh, you know, purchasing power parity, uh, the per capita income of Russians is now below Turkey. It was never that low before. And it's actually below a lot of countries in the area uh, where Russia basically had a, 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 a per capita edge in, uh, in, uh, in average, you know, uh, uh, citizen, you know, income. And that's that's eroding uh, again to the point where uh, they're poorer than a Turk, which is always a sympathy of an old insult in Russia. Um the uh, uh, if that changes, uh, that'll basically reduce a lot of the risk, a lot of the a lot of the threats that uh, you know Arctic uh, nations are, are are feeling. Sweden, for example, it wasn't just Denmark that had brought home to worry about. Uh, the the uh, oh, I think it was about five ten years ago, the Swedes did a little uh, war gaming, as it were, on defending Gotland. Because they got rid of uh, conscription, and suddenly they had far fewer uh, volunteer troops than they expected, and they eliminated the garrison they had to maintain uh, on Gotland, which is a, if you look at a map, it's a key. It's a, it's like a, like a, like a, you know, a, a land battleship in the middle of the Baltic, on the eastern end, and. Uh, uh, they realized that the Russians could, you know, I think they really did this after 2014 when they saw what happened in Crimea. They realized the Russians could just, uh, you know, land, you know, some by submarine or by air. Uh, and defenses were so weak, the population was so, you know, thin, as it were, small, that they could take over and then, you know, uh, say, do something about it. So the, 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 the Swedes did. They, re- they reintroduced conscription. Uh, they 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 raised the size of their their reserve force, which is built, which is similar to is what the Israelis adopted. They adopted from the Swiss and the Swedes, who basically have a small uh, standing army, whose main duty is to you know stand guard in places that need guarding, you know, like air force, some naval forces, and what have you. But most of them are there just to train the infantry uh, for you know less than a year usually. Um, and then they send them home with their combat uniforms and a automatic rifle and ammunition and orders and, and two sets of orders, one where to report to uh, join a regular unit and one where to join a local unit and fight in place. Uh, the Finns even uh, practice, well, the Norwegians are doing it now uh, up in their, their Finnmark uh, uh, with uh, taking out their, their reserve Arctic forces and running, uh, paying for these guys to spend extra times on active duty, uh, days on active duty to do it. And they don't get a lot of resistance because, you know, the civilians up there realize that they're the ones who are going to suffer most, especially in Norway. The Russians plowed into parts of Norway because there was simply nothing, you know, to stop them. Uh, and the and the you know the the, uh, the Germans weren't going to send additional troops up there to to clean up basically what was the backwater, uh, but they basically had to rebuild the civilian infrastructure you know after the war because so much damage had done to the few uh, civilian facilities uh, you know buildings roads what have you uh, way up there, um, so you know World War Two was a wake up call and. Uh, the Cold War kept the kept that you know uh, alertness going, and then Putin declaring the Cold War is on again in 2014 
boop, like Austin pointed out, you know, just he's uh, got it going again. So even if the Russians just say, all right, our our phony Cold War is over, and let's go, you know, uh, declare peace, uh, ignoring, of course, that the Chinese have started their own Cold War, um, the uh, the northern the NATO states or NATO, how should I put it, friendly states like uh, Finland and Sweden. Uh, are not going to, um, you know, drop their guard. The Canadians, same thing. The Canadians maintain, still maintain the dew line. Um, they basically took it over after the Soviet Union collapsed, and uh, they they maintain it because basically, uh, well, especially the Canadian portion where most of it was, um, because they realize they're the most at risk. And of course, that's one reason why the Canadians uh, even put forward the proposal to build a half a dozen nuclear submarines. Uh, to compliment on what the Americans were doing it, uh, doing they they couldn't do that because they couldn't afford it. But uh, they are buying new submarines and they may you know get the uh, they're getting the uh, near nuclear as it were with the uh, air independent propulsion, and the modern versions of that can have a conventional diesel electric sub uh, stay underwater for two weeks or more. I don't know about you know popping through thin ice. They could probably handle that too. Um, but the Canadians are very aware of their vulnerability on the northern flank. Um, they may talk about their vulnerability on their southern flank, but where they put their money is up where the Russians could come in. The um, so you know there is a <laughs> a a Arctic aspect to this new Cold War. Um, but it was going on long before the Russians decided to uh, officially revive you know, the old Cold War with accusations that NATO was plotting against Russia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. By the way, Ukraine is now seriously uh, you know, asking about um, uh, joining NATO. And in fact, we ran a piece, I think we ran it today, um, about the uh, Ukraine uh, company, state-owned uh, aircraft company, uh, got a license from Bell to build a UH-1 helicopter. Now, granted, it, by saying UH-1, you're thinking, ah, oh, that that one had a style in you know Vietnam. Well, no, there are still about a thousand of the original UH-1s uh, in service. Uh, many of them commercial, um, but it, the Bell has kept on uh, producing uh, in, improved versions. In fact, the Marines are still using it because it's a twin-engine Huey. Uh, with more safety uh, equipment and what have you, better electronics. Uh, and for a, any country or service like the Marines that don't need, uh, you know, heavy lift, they have special heavy lift helicopters for heavy lifting, but when they just need a lighter helicopter uh, with shorter range, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the improved Huey has served them quite well. It's also quite popular in Eastern Europe. Again, these are not naval nations. They they basically need shorter range helicopters, reliable Western technology, preferably. Um, and this is apparently all the negotiations with uh, Textron, which owns Bell uh, since 1960s. <laughs> Bell Textron bought it just as the just before the the Vietnam War started, and that turned their new acquisition. They spun off Bell. Bell had a, a space and uh, another high tech, you know, division which became parts of direct parts of Textron, and Bell just was producing helicopters. But that proved to be the most profitable division of Textron during the 60s because, you know, who needed 16,000, you know, modern helicopters? The U.S. Army. And who built them? Only, only Bell. Uh, they've since lost that advantage, but they're still a player in the helicopter uh, business, and it's suspected that, that Textron – might be uh, interested in investing a lot of money into Ukraine and and basically doing a, uh, you know, a uh, lighter versions of modern helicopters, you know, like a UH-1. Before, even before the UH-1, they had the, uh, the Bell 47, which was the last of the, uh, the high-performance piston engine helicopters. That, that kept being produced until the 70s or 80s, I think. Uh, but anyway, the... Uh, uh, there is a future uh, in uh, you know in expanding NATO to more threatened countries, and I think the Russians are our biggest ally in that department. Hey Dan, I want to uh, add something real quick about okay. John. I, I went and checked uh, because I, I've got a uh, uh, a column from uh, 2019 uh, talking about a speech made by. Uh, former Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo about the Arctic. The Chinese at 2019 were calling themselves, get this, a near-Arctic nation. 
And uh, so they, they're not an Arctic nation, but they're a near Arctic nation. And, uh, you know, that's the example of their uh, uh, creeping diplomacy. And that means uh, we're interested in uh, we're near Arctic. So uh, anyway, I thought. I and, thought they could, was, and they could probably persuade the Russians to cooperate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Until yeah, such yeah, time as yeah, the yeah, Chinese yeah. take possession. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Claimed, I, can, okay, the territory yeah, I just I'm just putting yeah. that that in there because no, they're claiming really that you know what what they want is what Xi Jinping wants is China to have a say in everything, and that that's part uh, if or, or maybe more than a, uh, a say control of everything. But you know the, we have interests. You must check with us or whatever. But uh, uh, anyway, that's I, I just thought I'd. I'd add, add that. Look, this this is it, it's a serious serious subject. Are there more dangerous places on the planet? Of course. I mean, and, and there's the uh, South China Sea uh, is much more uh, uh, explosive situation. Uh, Taiwan. I'm just picking with China, but you know, Ukraine is still exploding. You know, sorry. So is Afghanistan, and but. Uh, the Arctic area, and here this is something I used uh, in in that uh, column, which is why I went well and 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 checked it. That the the area is larger than the continent of Africa, and that's lost on most of the world because you know it. Oh, it's just up there and it's empty. Yeah, but it's huge, and they all these overlapping uh, maritime. Uh, claims involving uh, uh, exclusive economic zones, and the, the, Jim touched on this. I did earlier too. The Norwegian and Russian ones are very intermingled. That's the, they're really uh, 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 complicated. But uh, it, it's a there is a it's not just evidence. There's knowledge of resources in these areas, and. Some of them are – they're going to be developed. They are being developed. And so it's a, a Russian-Chinese uh, play on, on resources that <laughs> belong to really Canada, United States, uh, Norway, Denmark, too, through, uh, 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 through Greenland. And uh, it's uh, – so you've got you – know, when you have the U.S. and Canada and – on one side and Russia on the other, uh, you've got uh, you know potential for significant competition, if not conflict. Uh, but as the joke's been made several times, and when we were discussing doing this, it's a it's a cold war, and it's a difficult place in which to operate. Just uh, read your history of the. the few battles that took place in the Aleutians and realize that's still <laughs> south of the uh, uh, Arctic Circle. Operating up, uh, operating up there is very, very difficult. And, and it, oh, by the way, uh, the U.S. icebreaker situation is miserable. The Canadians are going to uh, build modern icebreakers. I believe uh, Jim may be uh, up on this that the, I know the Coast Guard requested two icebreakers, and I believe one, a big super one's been uh, been approved. But uh, it still takes a while to uh, uh, build them and field them and, by the way, train crews to operate them because they're a really specialized kind of ship. Well, we'll leave it at that, and uh, we'll talk to you gentlemen next time. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.